How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Welcome to Climate One, a conversation about America's economy, energy, and environment. To understand any of them, you have to understand them all. Today we're discussing food, energy, and water. Petroleum and water are at the center of discussions about sustaining our economy while dealing with the rising population as well as rising carbon pollution. Scientists say fresh water supplies will decline as global temperatures increase, and many corporate leaders now see water supplies as a serious concern for their business. On the energy side, demand is rising at the same time that emissions from fossil fuels need to start declining in order to stabilize the Earth's operating system. Food production uses large amounts of oil and water, and it takes just, imagine, 15 gallons of water produ to produce just one ear of corn. Over the next hour, we will probe the connection between food, energy, and water with our live audience here at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. Joining us, we're pleased to have Marvin Odom, president of the Shell Oil Company, the U.S. arm of Royal Dutch Shell, the world's largest corporation by revenues. Before my conversation with Mr. Odom, I'm going to talk for 15 minutes with Cho Kong, Shell's chief political analyst. We'll talk about Shell scenarios, and then Marvin will come up here and join us. So please welcome Cho Ong to uh, Climate One. Hey, Cho, Cho Kong, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so, Shell Scenarios looks out at the future and points different possible futures. Uh, and the most recent one, I think, was Scramble and, and, and Blueprint, and looked at uh, a number of things in terms of uh, the green revolution and a flight to coal. So, tell us the energy future that you see uh, with the things I mentioned, with such as rising demand and also increasing concern about carbon. Okay. Well. Could I just begin by saying something about where we come from? And may I just say thank you, Greg, for providing us with the, providing me with this opportunity to talk scenarios this evening, uh, particularly scenarios on energy. Uh, and um, just like to thank everyone for coming along to hear what I've got to say. Okay. Now, um, the thing about scenarios is that we look at the future, we paint alternative stories, alternative possibilities of how that future will develop. But the, the, the secret is, they're really about understanding the present. Where we are today, recognizing that the present is not constant. It's always changing. And the question we have is, in which direction will it change? So um, we've been looking at long-term energy issues ever since the Scenario team was founded more than 40 years ago in Shell. And I'd like to begin with the 2008 scenarios which you referred to, Scramble and Blueprints, because those set out two alternative visions, one in which every country, every nation looked to its own uh, in a global competition for energy supply, we call that world scramble, and the other one in, in the other world, blueprints, uh, we had a greater sense, a greater willingness of countries and very importantly of peoples to want to cooperate on energy and ultimately on dealing with the climate challenge. So when you talk about a flight to coal or flight away from coal, and we'll see both over the course of this century. We're talking about trends which are impelled by what people want. What do people want? They want growth, they want jobs, they want a, a sense of well-being. Um, and it's when we think about how economic growth is, yes, okay, um, the world as a whole may be getting more prosperous. It doesn't mean that everyone is feeling better off. Uh, if you look at a country like China today, it's recorded astounding rates of economic growth over the past 10, 20 years. Uh, but today, people are, in are increasingly questioning the price of that growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at uh, cities which are blanketed in, in uh, black carbon. Uh, we're looking, if I could just take, the, uh, uh, take a non-energy example, uh, pigs polluting a river that feeds into the water supply in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things going on which people say, in which, which lead people to say, what's the price of this growth? So 
great complexities come in to the picture that you know, we painted earlier on with Scramble and Blueprints, the idea that, yes, if, if uh, we can get together and agree, we'll deal much better with the climate challenge, we'll manage su su supply and demand over time, of course. Well, it's inevitable uh, as the developing countries, the large developing countries grow rapidly in the way China has grown, and China's only the first, India's following on, so is Brazil, and others will follow on behind them. They will use more energy, and a large chunk of that energy will be coal. But as they reach a certain level of development, their use of energy uh, will start to flatten off, and the percentage of coal will start to decline. The question is when. Can we bring that period, uh, can we bring that turning point further, further forwards, closer to our time, or will it be further away? And the question is whether we sort of destabilize the climate further by, by doing that. But I want to pick up on a question you talked or you mentioned earlier about sort of each country for themselves versus inter international cooperation or collective action. Uh, that hasn't worked so well through the United Nations process. Copenhagen was a was a big failure. Uh, there's not the U.S. and its own political system hasn't been able to come together. So do you look at it now and say that it, the chances of collective or cooperation are much smaller than they were when you first looked at it in 2008 when Copenhagen was on the horizon? Look, look Greg, at the end of the day, that's the only game in town so far as uh, the global community is concerned. So we do and uh, uh, we need to support that process. Having said that, there are two critical flaws. One is that it's a top-down process. It's driven by governments getting together, heads of state, political leaders, seeking agreement amongst themselves. Unless they have support from the bottom up, unless they get buy-in from their peoples, you're not going to build uh, that critical mass. You're not going to build that really substantive support that this sort of agreement needs because it involves difficult decisions. People have to say, uh, people have to recognize that uh, they need to sacrifice something today in order to get something else tomorrow. Uh, and unless political leaders act with the backings of their peoples, they're not going to get it. You're not going to get there. The second problem, of course, is uh, a well-known one. Uh, which is that you've got 190 countries in the United Nations, uh, and if one of them says, I don't agree, how are you going to get global cooperation? So can U.S. and China do something, cut a deal to move everyone forward? In blueprints, we actually argue, uh, that's the scenario from 2008, uh, we actually argue that um, at the end of the day, one, you've got to get critical mass of support which has to come from bottom up. It has to be grassroots support. We saw, we saw some early signs of that in 2008. Uh, they seem to have faded a bit, but we hope they will come back again. Having said that, once you get that momentum building up from the grassroots, you then need some sort of move uh, from top down as well. So top down comes to meet bottom up. Uh, but that top-down move cannot come with all 190 countries. You've got to get the leading countries from both, and this is very important to emphasize, from both the developed and developing worlds to agree uh, to a set of actions to deal with the climate challenge. Uh, so obviously, uh, the leading uh, developed country, the leading, so it appears, developing country, the US and China, have got to take a, a, a full position here. And other leading countries have to follow on. I don't know how many, but if we get three, four, five countries, it's a bit like a snowball. You know, as it gathers momentum, it will accumulate more and more countries, more and more critical mass. So something like 60 to 70 percent of the people in the United States say they favor a response to polls, saying they favor some kind of action on climate. There's been some some protests about the Keystone Pipeline. I don't know if you look at that as a favorable thing or a bad thing <laughs> for this kind of your grassroots support. Uh, do you see that that's, you know, w how do you judge that? Is that enough? I think the problem is people recognize in principle the need to act to deal with climate. Uh, the question, I think the crunch point comes when they reckon, when they are faced with difficult decisions that they have to take, when the cost is an or a, issue. a personal cost. That's fine if someone else pays, but if I have to pay something Absolutely. else. Absolutely. And companies face that, that question every day. Mm -hmm. If you want to add CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, to a power plant, you double the price of the power plant. So it's something I think we need to think about. And the way to deal with it is to have an effective price on carbon. So whatever mechanism you've got in mind, and we favor carbon, uh, carbon trading, uh, but whatever mechanism you've got in mind, you've got to value, you've got to put a price tag on the carbon that's being emitted from whatever activity you're engaged in. 
And where, as you talk about China's leadership, China is uh, testing some cap and trade systems mm. of different flavors that could potentially put a price on carbon with, for 20% of their 1.3 billion people. That's, that's a lot of people. Do you see that as the most promising area where pricing carbon could happen right now, or is it somewhere else? No. Let's be clear one thing about China, and that's a very important thing to bear in mind. Uh, the leadership recognizes the problem. Um, and they intend to deal with it, but the important thing before you can deal with the problem is to recognize it exists. That they do. The second point to bear in mind... They're ahead of the United States in that regard. Well, I think uh, the, the penny is dropping here too, so uh, hopefully we'll get both countries uh, in pole position before too long. But the second point I was going to bring in was this whole issue of urban pollution that they've got, black carbon. Uh, it's a huge issue. Uh, I don't know how many of you picked up the stories. Uh, in January of this year when Beijing was covered in smog. People saw the photo and, of the guy uh, jogging uh, with the mask on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, they recognize that economic growth, of which they're very proud of, has a price. And it has a price that needs to be costed in. And as far as the government is concerned, this cost is hitting the very people who benefited from growth uh, the most. That's the urban population and on which it critically depends for support and legitimacy. So mm -hmm. it recognizes if we don't do something about this, they'll do something to us. So I think that recognition is dawning. They will act on it. And let me just give you um, another uh, point of comparison. We look at uh, smog in China, we think how appalling. Uh, I don't think many people in the room perhaps were alive in 1952. Some of you were. <laughs> uh, uh, but may, uh, most I would wager we're not. Uh, but in 1952, I, I live in London. In 1952, we had the Great Smog. The Great Smog in London, in which 12,000 Londoners died. And the smog was so bad that it seeped inside of buildings, and uh, people in cinemas complained they couldn't see the screen. Wow. So it was as bad as that. And it finally impelled the British Parliament, in all its wisdom, passed the Clean Air Act in 1956. It took them a further four years, but they finally got around to doing, doing it. And we have, I would say, extremely clean air, but fairly decent air in London today. So you need to get that sort of uh, impetus going, public support saying we need to change. The difference now is that scientists say we don't have 50 years to get the carbon down, that it's much more urgent than that. Than, than LA had a, Los Angeles had a similar turnaround uh, from really bad air to cleaner air today. Mm -hmm. Not as clean as San Francisco. But uh, uh, the urgency is greater this time. Would you agree? I think the urgency is very great today. Um, we, I have to say this, Greg. We've been talking about, I've been talking about scramble and blueprints, the scenarios we came out with in 2008. In our latest set of scenarios, the ones we came out with this year, 2013, uh, we call those scenarios uh, mountains and oceans. And those scenarios carry a very stark warning that regardless of the scenario, we're heading for an overall global temperature rise of somewhere between 3.3 .3 to 4 degrees centigrade, yeah, depending on which scenario. So no Americans now, know what that means, but that's so 7 degrees to 11 degrees, something like that? Okay, yeah. But the benchmark which most people use is a 2 degrees centigrade uh, temperature rise. That's the benchmark that most people use. Uh, and so we're way over that benchmark, regardless of the scenario, and therefore we need to think, what are we going to do about this? Now, firstly, we have to start moving now to uh, uh, begin uh, to reduce the amount of carbon that we spew out into the air. Uh, in both scenarios, I have to say, by 2100, that's a long way into the future, we're going to get to zero, uh, zero carbon emissions. But it's, it's all that carbon that's already in, spewed out between now and then that's going to cause the global warming. And we need to act to do something of bringing that level of carbon down. And so for us, the lesson with these new scenarios, mountains and oceans, is how do we combine the best features of both into a possible third scenario? We're still working on that. Great. Well, uh, this interesting reading, these scenarios, it is an interesting outlook into various possible futures. Uh, it's on the web. So Dr. Cho Kong, thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. You thank you, everyone. That.
So uh, Marvin, welcome to Climate One. Thank you. Uh, let's get a baseline here in terms of climate and talk about uh, the scientific consensus that climate is, uh, is disrupted by burning fossil fuels. Where is your position and Shell's position on climate change and man-made climate change? Well, this is probably the easiest question you'll ask me all night because it's very clear for us as a company, and that is that climate change is real, um, that humans have an enormous impact on that, and that it requires some sort of action going forward. And what kind of risk does it present for the United States and for Shell as a company? Well, I think if you look at the, uh, at the, the policies that we advocate as a company, so getting outside of our, our direct day-to-day -day business, working with governments around the world, the, I'd say the number one element of that advocacy is putting a price on carbon. So we see it as a, as a big enough issue and a big enough risk the, to where we need that sort of global framework to then drive this market to somewhere different than it's headed right now. So a price on carbon meaning like what is emitted now from our tailpipes and smokestacks goes into the atmosphere unpriced and putting a price on that. Uh, and that's hap where is that happening around the world in a meaningful way? Well, it's I mean, it's actually happening. I, I spent some time with the governor today. So, you know, there, to a degree it's happening here in the state of California. Um, we see some evidence of that in uh, Australia. You see, the, uh, see it happening in Europe but to varying degrees of success, right? So the design of these programs is critically important. But so I, I think, you know, we have to, you know, both look at where it's happening, but also say, how can we do this in a more effective way? And what do you think about California's plan to price carbon pollution? They have a cap and trade program. Is that something that Shell supports? Yeah, so a cap and trade would be the preferred solution from our perspective. And just to be clear, cap and trade, you know, there's a lot of complaints about it being a complex system and so forth. But the thing that we really like about it is it's a market-driven system, and you get that full power of the market to bear then on actually reducing carbon. Cap meaning it actually you know, caps the, uh, the CO2 emissions, and then you can lower that cap over time. So you actually design it to get to the result that you're after. Um, and, and then a, a trading system, because the, the importance of the trading system is it allows that CO2 reduction at the lowest cost to the economy overall. Because you really do, you know, again, if you, if you think about the concern that people will have on a price on carbon, it's, you know, what's the impact on my pocketbook? What's the price of energy going to be? What's the impact on the economy in total? So you really want to go after those low-cost options to eliminate carbon from the atmosphere. But some businesses in California uh, complain that the, the price on carbon will drive up the cost of doing business, uh, and there actually there's litigation. Is that something? What's your position on the litigation and, and some of the complaints against uh, California's cap and trade system? Well, I think the I mean let me just let me just back up a little bit because it's it's you know about much more for us than uh, than just what's happening in California. Uh huh. And so I'd, I'd I'd ask you to look at what we're doing inside the company. And so we already have a price of carbon uh -huh. inside of our, a price on carbon inside of our company. We charge ourselves as we do our project economics, and we roll these projects up when we decide of the you know thirty three billion dollars we're going to invest every year, and we look at the economics of those and rank those. We've priced in forty dollars a ton for carbon emissions, which is much higher than any other price in the much world. Much higher than any of those trading systems that we talked about right, right. now. And so now that's, that's funny money in a way, right? I mean, we're not actually charging ourselves $40 a ton, but we're checking a couple of things. One is the resiliency of these projects in a world where we anticipate there will be a price on carbon, as well as it, it gets our, our people that put these projects together, that engineer these projects, to actually think in terms of, you know, is there a way for us to reduce the carbon emissions from this project? And if, mm -hmm. if I'm going to be burdened by $40 a ton, I'm going to think about that and see if I can find ways to bring that down. Uh, but it also results in, I'll, I'll give you a fairly straightforward example where if, if you're going to build a facility, one of the, uh, and there's a lot of facilities built around the world right now, one of the big challenges is capturing carbon from these facilities is very difficult because they weren't designed to have carbon captured. So you've got a little bit coming out over here, you've got some coming out over there, and retrofitting that is incredibly expensive. So now if you've got a project team that's thinking about that in advance, they might not, as, as Cho said, you know, you can double the price of a, a power plant. So you might not put in the carbon capture and storage right now, but you'll work this power plant and design it in a way where you have a capture point that can capture that CO2 that you're after. 
that's interesting that, that you actually have a price and you state it. Uh, I think Conoco uh, has a price, but not every oil company has a shadow price on carbon. Uh, there seems to be some different views whether that's a good idea, whether they're strategic, or uh, I'm interested in whether there's a debate in the company about having that price and disclosing it, because, I mean, is that competitive yeah. in any way? Well, no. I mean, I think it's so, again, it's if you're going to seriously advocate for a price on carbon and you do something like that into your com internal to the company, you need to be pretty transparent about that. So there's no controversy about discussing it. There's no controversy about discussing how we use it. Um, and I would advocate that it's a very powerful thing to do and an important thing to do if you believe in this. So the price on carbon pollution, California has a new cap and trade system. The price is now around $10 a ton. Uh, is it fair to say that if you're, you're pricing, charging yourselves 40, that you're prepared for that to go up to 40, you'll be okay because you've designed your systems to be, uh, live successful in a $40 per ton world? Well, I can tell you that we understand what the impact would be. <laughs> so it, so it, it's clearly not saying there wouldn't be an impact. Okay. The, uh, and, it, and, it, and it very much depends on, on how a project or how a system is designed. But, but for the, the price range that we're talking about, yes, we're prepared for that. And California system, you may have some issues with tweaks here and here. I wasn't quite sure whether you're involved in the litigation against California's cap and trade system. No, I don't think we're actually, we've been, a, we've been a strong supporter of AB 32. Um, we were openly opposed to Proposition 23. I think it was 23, wasn't it? Which was a ballot initiative to basically uh, cease California's main climate laws. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So no, I, I, there hadn't been a lot of controversy on that for us. Now, one of the things we will continue to do, and I, as I said, you know, in some of the conversations I had earlier today, we'll never be hesitant about recommending ways to improve the design of a program. You know, that, and that includes tweaks to AB 32 or, or the, you know, LCFS or whatever. The low carbon fuel low standard. Carbon fuel which standard. Is a... so, so we'll always be in that conversation in that mix on ways to improve it. But we've supported the program and the goals of the program. Natural gas is one fuel that, that a lot of people look to as a possible, it's talked about as a bridge to the future for a low carbon future. Um, Shell, I believe, is now more of a gas company than an oil company. So let's talk about natural gas and this new energy mix in future. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody in this room I know is perfectly aware of what's happened, particularly on this continent over the last half a decade or so, where there's just a tremendous amount of natural gas resources that you know, as I think you've heard in some of these previous presentations, is really changing the energy landscape in total. Now, the, the impact of that, if we've been talking about CO2 and a price on carbon, the impact on that has actually been a reduction in CO2 emissions across the, uh, across the U.S. And, and primarily that's because more natural gas has gone into power generation mm -hmm. and more coal has been backed out. And, and I will tell you that the single, you know, if, if, if my perspective as a company and advocating for what we've been talking about is to reduce carbon emissions, probably the single most impactful thing that we can do over the next decade and a half to two decades is to drive natural gas in and drive coal out because of its affordability, because of the difference in CO2 emissions, because all the technology is there. And at the same time, then we, we can work on things like carbon capture and storage, which we're now doing at, at full scale in, in Canada, to see if we can then match that technology up with natural gas fired power generation over time to move that even closer to a zero emission source of energy. And Shell got out of the oil, uh, coal business, was in the coal business at one point, and you're uh, fortunate you've been going from coal to oil now uh, to natural gas, so you've been lightening your carbon footprint. Uh, but the premise there about natural gas being better than coal is based on some math that isn't quite clear yet. And you're working on clearing that math, but it based on whether how that gas is produced, it may be worse than coal or equal to coal, depending on how it's done. Yeah, I think this is the prime, one of the primary challenges that I hear around natural gas development right now. And some people will call it fugitive emissions. So it's, it's methane leaking into the air from the development of natural gas, either in the drilling process or in the fracture treating process or in the, uh, the straight production of that natural gas. And you see predictions all the way across the map from you know, relatively low emissions to emissions such that it would make it about equivalent to, uh, to coal, um, thus removing the benefits. So what, what we decided to do, and I know Fred Krupp has been here before, is we said, well, we need to get out of the business of speculating on what it is, and we need to get into the business of understanding the science behind it. And so we joined up together with, with several companies, and uh, I think actually we're nine companies now, including Chevron here in the state. And, w and we've invited EDF and the University of Texas and some other academic organizations to actually go to, to our facilities and test each stage of this development and actually measure the methane emissions associated with that. 
And that study should be coming out in the next two months sometime. I think in May or June it should, uh, should be available to the public. But there's something like a thousand companies that frack for natural gas in the country, and that may measure the way Shell does it or the big companies, but there's lots of Jed Clampets out there that are poking holes and, and mining natural gas, and no one's looking over their shoulder to see well, how they're doing it. Yeah, so this is another place where, again, I, I don't apologize for being very direct, and that is that you know, there's, a, there's a goal in, in you know, working with groups like Fred Krupp and EDF, and there's a, there's a goal behind us putting out our operating principles for how to develop shale gas and oil onshore the right way. And that is, we want to develop a standard for the industry, and we want that standard to be, to be adopted into regulations. And we want every company operating in this space to be held to those regulations. Okay, and that, but that right now, fracking is regulated at the state. So that means, I don't know, 30 something states adopting those rules. Government is, is much slower than technology and industry right now. Government's playing catch up. There's already fracking going on. If there's leaking or water contamination going on, it's happening now and the regulators don't have the resources or the knowledge or maybe they don't want to get around to doing that. How do you deal with that tension with well, regulators? I, I mean, I think you have to view it as a, uh, you know, like everything that we could, anything we could talk about. It's, we're going through a period of transition. So I think the important thing to do is get the scientific data um, and then act accordingly. So I, I expect this fugitive emissions data will fold directly into what I would call a set of best practices on, on how to develop these type resources. So that's going to be a critical element of, of what I think will emerge is, is something that should show up in state level regulations. Now we already see states that are doing that, right? There are states that have these, what I would call the critical elements of that already in place. And there are others that are moving that direction. And, and I think it's better, my personal opinion is it's better to, to help push those states along um, than, to, than to try to wait for this, you know, grand federal versus states rights discussion, which could go on for another 20 years. So let's work with the states who have the primacy now and let's help them get to the right place. So does that mean that Shell's going to sell, pe Shell's going to send people into the state house in Texas or Wyoming or South Dakota and say, we've developed these principles, these ought to become regulations. And your friends at the bar are not going to be very happy that, oh, you're, you know, that's why you're doing that. It's going to cost me money. I don't want to do that. There's some tension there between, I mean, are you really going to go in and, and have the legislators or the regulators adopt these principles? So there's absolute tension there, <laughs> and that's exactly what we do. So, I mean, it, it is exactly what we do. So the reason we put these principles together, which for clarity address the mechanical integrity of a well, because that's the real concern when it comes to developing these resources, it deals with air emissions issues and, uh, and reducing fugitive emissions with protecting water sources and recycling water wherever possible. It deals with minimizing the footprint of this activity. And, it, and the fifth principle is around how do you work with communities where this kind of development can have a significant impact on increasing populations, on overloading schools and overloading roads. So all of those are important. So not only do we put them together, and I think there's now something like 59 or 60 elements that sit behind those five principles, but we are taking them to the states. And we've also been very clear publicly which ones of these we think apply to all of our operations worldwide. So as you go into our website and you look at the details underneath these principles, it will say worldwide, which means if I'm drilling a well in, in, a, uh, you know, in, in a province in China, or I'm drilling a well in Argentina, or I'm doing it in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, it's done the same way. And I want to pick up on, on water because water uh, is projected. There's projected to be less water in the future as snowpacks decline. Uh, waterless fracking, is that a possibility? At what point do you decide to recycle all the water from, from fracking? That involves fewer trucks into neighborhoods and, and out. A lot of the truck traffic, which uh, people object to, is, is water in and out. So yeah. let's talk about water recycling and, and water efficiency with fracking. So it's a, I, I'm, again, I'm convinced it's a mindset, right? So the, I try to pick the most controversial areas. So the Marcellus is a fairly controversial area for shale development. A lot of it happening, but I mean, there's a lot of debate back and forth in the Marcellus. We've been there for you know, four years or so now, and we already recycle probably 99% of the water. Uh, and, and our operations and our operations are expanding as, as we is speak. Is that more expensive or cheaper to recycle the water? Uh, it's more expensive on the front end. Mm -hmm. And, but then when you think about, you know, a, a large development that will take place over a 10 to 20 year time period, if you have that mindset going in and you build the loop systems to where you can capture and, and, uh, and store and then, and then reuse water, it's cheaper in the long run, but you have to have that perspective to put the investment in up front. 
And it, that, that is a, a mindset mentality because a lot of uh, Wall Street these days, I hear a lot about companies want to do things a certain way, but they get whacked by the street because they spend more money up front yeah. and they're, because of quarterly earnings and don't spend this money today when you can you know, spend some more tomorrow. Yeah. And, and so we deal with that, but I think we strike that balance about right. So I, I'm going to take you back to CCS because I, I like carbon capture and storage. Because I like Joe's example of the power plant, you can double the cost to put in carbon capture and storage. So we have investors, of course, in the company. We're involved in the oil sands development, another controversial area in Canada. And this is where we're putting in a carbon capture and storage project, which has a price tag of over a billion dollars. Now, there's no return on that billion dollars. You know, part of that price tag is being picked up by the, uh, the, both the provincial and the federal government in Canada, and the rest we're providing. But I think our shareholders understand, just like they understand this concept of how we charge ourselves $40 a ton, they understand that the world is changing. And you know, some of the questions that I'll get it from investors are not, why are you wasting your money on this? The questions might actually come in the form of, well, I'm worried you might be investing in something that's going to be a stranded asset in a changing world. And how are you preparing for that changing world? So I, I think investors are savvy enough to understand what we're doing here. And carbon capture and sequestration has been very hard. Uh, the federal government has put billions of dollars into it. Uh, no one inter internationally has really cracked it at uh, an industrial scale at, at, a, at a reasonable cost. Is that the concern with uh, carbon capture by the investors? Is like, oh, is this going to be a white elephant You're up there? Well, I think, no, I think, I think generally the, the way we're doing it, which is you know, picking several projects around the globe to go after and demonstrate, I feel like we have strong support from our investors. But the goal is, is to find a way to lower the cost of, of that, that technology. So the technology works. There's nothing magic about capturing CO2, compressing it, putting it in a pipeline, and putting it deep underground. That's all stuff we know how to do right now. The trick is doing it at scale, and at scale is where you learn how to then reduce the cost over time. Because this, you know, this is something that could be very important to us over the next 30, 40 years. There, there's some concern about that carbon dioxide uh, leaking, leaking in, the, in the future, and is that something that is, is a company risk, or is that, a, is that a, a social risk up in Canada, that if you, know, you put it down on the ground, but CO2, if it leaks up into a neighborhood or somewhere, yeah. uh, maybe you're doing it away from, from residential areas, but it, where is the risk for future um, problems with that CO2? Yeah, it's one, of the, uh, it's one of the conversations we had to work through with the, with the government of Canada, is where is that going to sit over time? Uh, but, but there's a way to work through that, you know, both contractually and, and from a regulatory standpoint, and that'll be a shared responsibility in this case. Uh, but the more important aspect is not necessarily where the liability sits, but what's the engineering that goes into making sure that that never happens. And so it, it is a matter of, you know, both putting our experts on it to design it. It's a matter of bringing in third-party ex experts who have no vested interest in what's happening there, you know, to put their seal of approval on it. Um, and so we've done that quite extensively and to the satisfaction of the Canadian government. Let's talk about another uh, nexus here. Uh, corn and water, food and water, there's often a tension there. Uh, Shell is not a big player in, in corn ethanol in the United States. Why? Well, because I'm not really sure it makes sense it, to be a little bit too frank about it. Well, it the, uh, everyone says that unless they're a corn farmer. And yeah, a corn no, politician. exactly. So I, yeah. so I understand it from a farmer's perspective. So, you know, from my perspective, what would be the driver for us is looking for a transportation fuel that has a lower carbon intensity than, than oil and gas. And, and corn ethanol for us doesn't fit that bill. Now, you know, we, but we understand transportation fuels and we spend a lot of time in that space. We work directly with our customers. And so we scanned the world and said, you know, biofuels may actually be the, the, one of the, you know, technologies at our fingertips to help replace and lower, replace some, and lower the carbon intensity of the transportation fuel sector. And what we came up with was biofuels, yes, but in Brazil, made from sugar cane, where mm -hmm. irrigation is not required to produce it. And we end up with something like a 70% reduction in CO2 intensity by the time you get and use that as a fuel. So it's water efficient and it's not competing with food. That's right. And it doesn't require, you know, the, the deforestation of additional land and so forth. So, we, again, we scoured the world to say, where's the right place to do this? We're now one of the, one of the largest single entities producing biofuels. And it's, it still struggles to get out of the country because the country is basically consuming everything that we're producing. 
And so you look at some of the tension over corn ethanol and, and uh, uh, hog farmers and others saying this darn ethanol uh, mandates are driving up the cost of uh, their feed and therefore our food. Uh, you think there's, well, how do you view that sitting on the sidelines as you are? Well, I think we just, you know, I rely on the facts, you know, so <laughs> I rely on the facts, meaning, you know, what, what is the competition with food and let's be clear about that. What is the TO, CO2 intensity and let's be clear about that. And, and effectively, that's a policy decision in terms of, and by policy decision, I mean a government decision on making those trade-offs. That's, that's not our industry or my company's decision to do that. Are biofuels going to be a bigger part of the transportation uh, power source in the future? Yeah, I think, they, I think they will. But I think biofuels are a great example of where this requires a suite of solutions and not one individual solution. So biofuels are not going to be the, the panacea to transportation fuels but they will fill a, uh, a portion of that sector and in, a, in very important ways. But you'll see the you know, different parts of the world, different geographies, different climates will have different solutions that make sense in that space. We talked a little bit about natural gas. I think the, the concept, which has been around forever, and there's probably natural gas vehicles that run in San Francisco, of course, and maybe some buses and others. We have taxis that run on natural taxis. gas, fleets, yeah. yeah. So, but I think the, this whole concept of taking this vast amount of natural gas that the U.S. now has and driving that into the transportation sector, and what I'm interested in, what we're interested in, in as a company and where we're putting our money is into liquefied natural gas going into heavy transportation. So 18-wheel trucks, rail, marine vessels all around this country, there is a, what, what I would call a significant advantage from almost any way you look at it from that perspective. So I can imagine there's people in the room that say, yeah, but this all depends on developing shale gas the right way. So let's, let's say we take these principles and we develop it the right way. Then we're talking about significantly lower emissions. And by that, I mean also from a particulate standpoint, you know, the smog you see in the air, virtually none of that coming from LNG as a fuel. And you see, so you get the environmental benefits of that, and it can happen at a significantly lower cost than what, what the world pays for diesel today because of the pricing in North America. The Arctic is another area uh, that's been in the news a lot lately. Shell had some troubles up there. How's that going for you? Well, I really, <laughs> I really appreciate you raising that. No, <laughs> the, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a challenging year, I'll say. The, uh, the couple of thoughts on the Arctic and, and where I think we're headed with this. And you have to step back a little bit and, and look at it from a global perspective and then you, know, you come and look at it from a U.S. government perspective and then I'll come back to the company. But there is a, you know, in, in both in our scenarios and just an understanding of where energy is going globally, I think there's a pretty clear understanding that fossil fuels will be required for quite some time still. Oil resources will be required for quite some time still. If you look at where, where the, the reserves are likely remaining across the globe, probably 25% of those are in the Arctic regions. So, there, so we, you know, whether or not the world chooses to do it is a question. Which we should say. Probably there is, is, is a significant factor. And they're more accessible in a warming world with, now that the Arctic melt is, yep. yeah, there's no more ice up there. Yep. Right. No, that's right. I mean, it's, it, so the answer to that is yes. I, what I was going to say is, you know, we, we had an experience this past year in the Arctic where there was actually more ice than there had been in the last 10 years. But that, that doesn't change the phenomenon you're talking about because there is more melting, there is more space, but it still can vary quite a bit from year to year. So we had a very, very short season this year, but the trend is, is correct. But there's less ice, and that will make this kind of activity easier, un unquestionably. I think from a, from a U.S. government perspective, there's a strategic element to saying you know, we want to understand the, uh, the, at least the quantity of resources that are there as part of our decision making on what to do with it. Um, and, and they have worked with us, it's been a long arduous, pa arduous path in a lot of ways, but they've worked with us on what is the, the right way, what are the elements that will be required to explore and find out what those resources actually are. And that's the phase we're in right now. Um, so we were up, you know, we've worked five years with the federal government on the permitting and, and designing a system to do that. We started that in 2012. We had some fairly public mishaps. The, uh, you know, the most significant of those, which was the grounding, meaning you know, up onto the shoreline of a drilling rig, which didn't have anything to do with drilling operations, by the way. This is when we had left the, uh, the North Slope 
and had, had come down to the southern portion of Alaska and were towing the rig to Seattle and, and lost, lost it in a storm, and then it ran aground in southern, southern Alaska, Kodiak Island in that area, um, south of Alaska. But still, you know, very public and, a, uh, you know, for me, absolutely, actually a, an embarrassing event. I hate to see something like that happen. But there are some real learnings that come out of that from a marine transportation um, perspective. And we've worked now with the government on what needs to be done different before we go back and continue drilling. Uh, when the Alaska pipeline was built, there was some people thought that the industry sort of was overconfident about its engineering abilities and the pipeline was harder and more expensive than initially thought. Is it possible that drilling in the Arctic is harder and more complex than, than you anticipated? Uh, so I never take it lightly is the, uh, I think, the most important thing that, uh, that I can say to that question. But it's not something that we haven't done before. So there's, there's been, you know, we, off, off the north slope of Alaska, you have the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea. There's been about 30 wells drilled in the Beaufort to, you know, mm -hmm. to this point in history, and we drilled a number of those. There's been five wells that have been drilled in the Chukchi, and we drilled four of those five. So it's not an unknown quantity from that, that perspective. Now, that, in no way is that an excuse for you know, losing a drilling rig in a storm and having it run aground. You know, that's a separate issue that we have to address and, and, and put some other marine transit elements in place to make sure that, you know, there's no chance of that happening again. But, so we don't take it lightly, but we, we do know how to do this, actually, to drill these wells. Um, the, there's one aspect that, you know, I, again, I don't think this will be new for anybody in the room, but one aspect of, of drilling in particular in, in an area that's as remote as offshore Alaska and that is that you take everything with you when you go. And it's the, it's the biggest concern about the Arctic is you're too far away from response capability and so forth, which I completely agree with. But the, the only then reasonable response to that is you take everything with you based on a design with the government, in this case, of a worst case scenario, and that you're able to respond on the spot with the, with the assets that are already in place. And that's the way this is put together. So I think somebody told me that that when this, this element is in operation offshore, it's something like the ninth largest Navy in the world. I mean, it is quite a substantial number of assets. The Natural Resources Defense Council, Sierra Club, a lot of environmentalists are hitting you pretty hard on this one. Is there any middle ground, or is it just, is it just they want no drilling up there, period? Or is there something, accommodations, environmental protections, more safeguards, more response capabilities, uh, something that, that, uh, that they want from you that you could do? Well, I, th I think it's a mix. So you, there, are, there are groups that where the a answer is absolutely no, and there is no amount of fix or, or barriers or, or redundancy that will make that okay. Zero is the only answer. Zero yeah. is the only answer. Uh -huh. And I think there are a number of groups in that place. And there, there are clearly a number of groups that we found that we're working with on, you know, what I tend to call this, how do you do it the right way? How do we make sure we put the right protections in place? There's a, an, another area of the, the hydrocarbon equation right now, which is um, the idea of, of unburnable carbon. And, and uh, HSBC, the large British bank, came out with a, a report saying that if the world is serious about keeping uh, greenhouse gas emissions warming below two degrees centigrade, which the uh, international uh, community has said that's the level of uh, the, the highest safe level of, of warming. If the world's serious about that, some of the of the uh, hydrocarbon reserves on the uh, books of uh, fossil fuel companies will be unburnable. And you mentioned earlier stranded assets. Is there any concern among your investors that some of the, the assets uh, that prop up the, the price of Shell and other uh, energy companies may be unburnable in a, in a really hot world? Yeah, I mean, I think that's when I mentioned earlier the, this, this concept of stranded assets, and that's something on investors' mind. I, I can tell you it's been on our mind a long time before it hit investors consciousness, mm -hmm. because that's exactly the world we live in. I mean, if, if we're, we're investing at a level of about 30 to $35 billion a year in new projects. Most of these projects will last on the order of 10 to 20 to 30 years. And so we have to take a perspective that says, where is the world going over the next 30 or even 40 years in some cases? And we absolutely think of it in that context. It's, it's one of the ways that we use the, the scenarios that we have in Shell. And one of the things I really like about the scenarios is Cho and, and his team, they develop them independent of the, the management of the company. So these are, you know, this is a, a real thought group 
that sits out there on its own and brings these scenarios into us as a, as a leadership group and a management team so that we can test our own thinking, which sometimes can be a little bit conventional, against this kind of forward look in terms of where the world is going. And, and it results in asking ourselves these type of questions. So we make our investments with this in mind. So what are the scenarios in which you know, the world gets serious or something, you know, uh, Hurricane Sandy or multiple Sandys and the world says, look, we've got to get real serious about carbon fast, then what are the paths for Shell? How do you adapt to a world in that, in that situation? And how would it affect the company? Well, I think there, so it, there, there may be elements that move fast, but I think you have to talk fast in terms of well, energy, the yes, energy yes. system. And it is an amazingly complex and enormous system that doesn't change overnight. So as, as much as anybody may wish for the energy system to change overnight, it, it won't do it, and it can't do it. It's just physically impossible. Um, you know, I, I, I joke about this sometimes, but the name of the company is Shell Oil Company in the U.S. But, you know, we produce more natural gas now as a company globally than we do oil. And that, that didn't happen by accident, right? This is because this is in our thinking of where is the world going, what's the preferred fuel. And we can clearly see a universe here where natural gas is going to be preferred over oil. It doesn't mean oil usage is going to go away doesn't mean we're not still going to produce oil and, and play in part of that market. But you can, you can now visually, tangibly see the transition in the company to more natural gas. At the same time, we're thinking through, you know, what will be the breakthrough technologies? You know, what is it that, that comes, you know, we, most of the people in this company will be focused on delivering the pieces of the business they need to deliver tomorrow and next month and by the end of the year. But at, at the leadership level of this company, we have to be thinking, you know, what happens in 2025? What happens in 2050? You know, Cho's now taking the scenarios to 2100. That actually matters to us. You know, where does solar fit into that? Where do other renewables fit into that? And we factor that into our thinking and, and our investments. So Shell is moving consciously toward a lower carbon posture portfolio. Uh, at natural gas, uh, uh, more so than oil. Um, the, the tar sands in Canada is one perhaps exception to that, that that oil there is anywhere between 6 to 17 percent more carbon intensive, dirtier than conventional fuel. So how does that affect uh, your, your move toward lower carbon fuels? That You have a, a one of the biggest processors of tar sands up in Alberta, Canada. We are. So we make about a quarter of a million barrels a day of that crude. And so and we came later to the game in, uh, in terms of oil sands development in Canada. So we're more to that 6 to 7 percent range. So if you think about the average crude across this, this continent, the, our oil sands operations are on the 67 percent more, 6 to 7 percent more CO2 intensive. So first of all, it's just important <clears throat> to understand that's the difference. It's not you know twice as intensive mm -hmm. or so, but six or seven percent <clears throat> more, um, and and it's a continually moving position. And it's why I mentioned the carbon capture and storage project that we're putting in associated with oil sands development in Canada is to capture some of those CO2 emissions and store them underground. So I, I have some numbers for you that I I find interesting. I, I, maybe you will. The uh, let me start with what the EPA, I think, put out about a year ago. Uh, it was a list of the top 100 CO2 emitters in the country. It was focused on the U.S. It was the top 100 in the country. I think, you know, the vast majority of those were coal-fired power plants. And the top 10, 9 or 10, as individual facilities emitted over 20 million tons per annum, million tons of carbon per annum per year. Now, our, we're a large oil sands operator. Um, 250,000 barrels a day, the entire system emits about 5 million tons per annum. That entire enormous operation, thousands and thousands of people, that's what it emits. Now this carbon capture and storage project that we're putting in place of that 5.3 million tons per annum will capture a million tons per annum and store it permanently underground. So I, I think this, you know, we're dealing in a space where if the goal is reduced CO2 emissions, the facts really do matter that that liquid resource to, to fuel transportation and so forth is still important and will be important for some time to come. And, and those numbers matter when it comes to really bringing down CO2 emissions across the country and across the world. So you're saying the technology exists at a price. So what's the price per ton to, to store that carbon? Do you know? Can well, you it's a lot right now. So the, you know, <clears throat> I told you we charge ourselves, you know, notionally $40 a ton inside the company. 
I think the, uh, the cost for carbon capture and storage right now is, is certainly over $100 a ton. It, it varies depending on where you are in the world, but it also points to the fact that, you know, if we're in a world that doesn't have renewable answers yet that can replace fossil fuels, carbon capture and storage, particularly in the scenario that you just mentioned, which is a real need to move fast around reducing carbon emissions, uh, carbon capture and storage could be very, very important to us. So the key is finding a way now to use that existing technology and bring that cost down from over $100 a ton to something that's more manageable to economies around the world. That's what we're trying to do. So it sounds like a hedge to me. That, like, that you spend a lot of money, you spend uh, $100 on something, there, there's no price on it now, but you better be prepared in case something happens. This, this is money. It sounds like insurance or a hedge. Is that? Well, I don't know where, I don't know where this, this happened in my, my career, but somewhere in the last 20 years, you know, the light bulb went on and said, all of this has to be a suite of solutions. You know, there is no individual solution that's a panacea to the energy issue and the environmental issues associated with it across the world. It will take a, a very large suite of opportunities to have the impact we're looking to have. Another large resource uh, pool is the Monterey Shale here in California. It's been looked at, eyed uh, by the oil companies uh, for a very long time, decades. Uh, now we're hearing more about it. It could have potentially half the oil of the north slope of Alaska. Uh, will it be developed? Are you, uh, what's your view on the Monterey Shale, which is this unconventional deposit in, uh, in California that's potentially huge? Yeah, I think there's a, uh, you know, a comment I'd make more broadly about about shale development, you know, whether it's across the U.S. or across the world, because we're working in you know, a number of countries around the world on, on this resource, is that there's a, still a lot to be learned. Now, what, what's been learned, and I think is pretty clear to us now, is that the, natural, the shale gas, natural gas coming from shales, across the country there's been enough drilling and enough development to know that that's real. And when you hear people say there's a 100-year supply of gas, that's real. It really is out there. On the oil side, the developments are a little newer. So, we, you know, you hear about the Bakken in the Dakotas. Um, you hear about the Eagleford in Texas. You hear about the Monterey Shale. But those are much earlier in their development. And what I'll tell you is there's a lot of variability in Mother Nature here, Mother Nature here in terms of, you know, how producible it is, the quantities it will, will produce, whether or not that's economic. So if you're an oil producer, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. If you're a state looking to boost the economy, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the resources there, but it's far from a given still. And I'd, I'd put the Monterey Shale in that category. So it may remain a, a, a opportunity for the future for a long time. There's oil there. The question is, can you economically develop it and, and how pervasive is it? And that's still an open question. Another question in California is whether uh, oil extraction ought to be taxed. California is the only state that doesn't have an extraction or a severance tax. Alaska uh, taxes oil extraction at 12 percent, Louisiana 12 percent, Texas and Wyoming around 5 or 6 percent. Uh, there's some interest in California in, in putting a tax on that. Uh, would you for or against that? <laughs> I'm against that. Right? Gee, I mean, I, I, I want you know, obviously some predictable statements from me tonight. I mean, it, I, it, what I've, what I've, what do I, uh, What's do the I defense? Look, do I look at you and say, I think you should just take more money from these operations just because? No. Now, at the same time, you heard me say, I think there ought to be a price on carbon, which in some respects is the same thing, right? It's, it's taking money from the production of these resources that would, would otherwise go to the company. Um, but the, the thing I like about a price on carbon, the reason why you hear myself and us push very hard on a cap and trade system is one of the things that worries me most is the money going to the result that we're, <clears throat> we're searching to get. So straight taxes, I'm not looking to increase the taxes on the business. If you put a carbon price out there, we pay more money to make up for that, that price on carbon. And that money that's paid goes directly to reducing carbon from the uh, from carbon emissions, whether through research and development or through physical reduction of carbon emissions, then that's okay. But just putting a price on carbon and having it go generally into the tax fund and being spent on whatever, I'm, I'm actually just not okay with that. So California has cap and trade, so don't do a severance tax. That it's cap and trade is address, addressing the issue. Yeah. Okay. And I think the reason why it's debated is, is because there, you know, the, there is a link between the amount of taxes and the level of activity. 
there, there's just a straight economic calculation on this that, that will be part of that. And there's, there's, a, there, there's a calculation to be made on what is the right level of tax um, that gets that balance right between revenues directly from the resource being developed and revenues that come from the economic activity that it stimulates through the jobs, both direct and indirect. Well, Alaska and Texas have uh, severance taxes, and last I checked, there's a lot of drilling going on in those states. It's not stopping that activity in those states. Are you saying? But, I, but I, what I am saying is that when we get to, it, it depends on the, you know, the, the whole of the economic equation. But I'll tell you right now across the country where natural gas prices have been relatively low. Uh, they're up a little bit over $4 now, but they've been down in the 2 and $3 range. When you're, when you're talking about those kind of prices for, a, uh, for an energy source, then these kind of numbers on tax matter. And that, that, where we shift our money, both in the country and around the world, that number does matter. One local question. San Francisco, the Board of Supervisors recently voted to divest their pension system from oil companies. A number of universities and states or universities and cities are considering that. Is that on your radar at all as something that, that is of significance? Has any, any investors mentioned that? Is that just a, a liberal left coast thing? No, it's, it's, far, it's far from that. And I think everybody here probably recognizes that this isn't the only part of the world that's thinking about these kind of issues. As a matter of fact, on the last week I was in London. Um, we have an event that we call our, it's our social response, socially responsible investors event, where, you know, I don't know how much of the, the investment in the company was represented in that room, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was 30% or more. And these are specialists in these firms and, and other representatives from pension funds and, and other places that are interested in the socially responsible side of this business. Mm -hmm. And we have day-long conversations about everything from oil sands to the Arctic to what we want to do with CO2 to where we are with the CO2 reduction target, the full suite. So yes, they're very interested in this space. And I think they look for companies that are progressive in this space. Uh, so the, the investment community is going through a transition as well, I would say. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of investors out there that are interested in what is, what's this quarter's results and what are the next quarter results. But I do see a shift much more into the, uh, the SRI space, as we call it. Steve Cole wrote a book called Private Empire about ExxonMobil. And he wrote, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, said that the one thing that made ExxonMobil anxious about their business model was a breakthrough in battery technology, car battery technology. So I drive an electric car, some people in the audience do. Does that make you a little anxious, the idea that if there was a sudden blossoming or breakthrough in electric vehicles, that could be a challenge to liquid transportation fuels? You know, I think there's a, I think there's a misconception of, I can't speak for companies broadly, I can really only speak for my own. I think there's a misconception when, when a lot of people look at Shell and say, you know, these guys are really about defending the business that they're in. And I will tell you that when we sit in our executive committee meetings and we talk about the strategy of this company, where we're going, it's about how is the world changing and where is going to be the right place to be positioned in that changing world. And that goes to questions about how long you stay in certain resources, how much R&D money you put into uh, to the, very, the investment, to the development of, of technologies. But it also means that you, you know, you, you connect yourself with the brightest minds in these areas, whether that's through universities or venture capitalists or otherwise, and you keep very close tabs on how development is happening. So we never remove the, the concept of a, a true breakthrough, overnight you know, breakthrough in technology, but we're also pretty realistic about the approach in terms of the likelihood of that happening. And if that does happen, you know, how could, quickly could we make an implementation take place? And, and again, all these investments are done in that context. I heard Peter Voser, a chairman of, of Shell, speak last year in Silicon Valley about the innovator's dilemma and how large companies often don't develop the innovations. They, they, they do kind of protect what made them successful. And, um, but so let's... Well, but, so if I could... Add, sure. We'll go. I think it's a, it's a point, of, again, about the, the Shell scenarios that are developed. Is it, it's an easy trap to get stuck in that conventional thinking. Very easy. And, and I will tell you, if you get a chance to grab these scenarios and read through them, you will, I think you'll see a real demonstration of how it's that thought process that pulls you out of that conventional thinking. So when you challenge me around breakthrough technologies, whether it's battery or it's something else, that's actually the conversation we're having. Great. Let's have our next audience, our first audience question in Climate One. Welcome. Hi, Charles Reed, Lawrence Livermore Lab. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about geoengineering, because it seems that it's almost the 
opposite of uh, carbon emissions in that you can get a small number of uh, states or non-state actors uh, having a large effect on a very complicated system that we don't understand. Uh, and when you bring in uh, the cost of carbon, there might be uh, financial motivations to, to do geoengineering uh, and have carbon credits. So could you speak to uh, your, th your thoughts on that? And please define briefly what geoengineering you understand well, it to be. Well, at least I'll okay. give you mine. Yeah. Don't leave, because I'm going to give you my interpretation of what. The, uh, but Lawrence Livermore is an example of a group that we work with. So, you know, we work on specific projects with the lab. And the, uh, but I think geoengineering, if you mean other ways to reduce carbon content in the atmosphere other than just reducing emissions from power plants and so forth, it, but is there a way to draw carbon from the atmosphere and or deflect heat back or into deflect the, heat, you right. know, so, you know, whether it's large scale, you know, mirrors that push heat back to the, uh, back to space or, so it, conceptually, yes, but to be perfectly frank, we depend on people like you to think about that at Lawrence Livermore and other places. And it's why you see some of our funding going back into uh, those areas is we recognize that's not our strength, but we recognize there are research institutions that very much do that and uh, as a core expertise. So we rely on you. Let's have our next uh, audience question here at Climate One for uh, Marvin Odom, president of Shell Oil Company. Uh, Dave Masson, Citizens Climate Lobby. I appreciate your focus on a price on carbon and uh, understand that you still favor cap and trade to, uh, to get there. In Washington nowadays, most of the talk seems to be about a carbon tax. And I wonder what your views actually are about, about that option, which um, would still be market-based, uh, maybe more predictable than cap and trade, uh, still possible to predict the emissions uh, reduction results, and uh, maybe more possible to get Republican support. It's made revenue neutral. Government doesn't keep any money. It's returned to citizens. Um, and we may be able to get uh, bipartisan support. Well, what's, what would be your view of that? No, I, I appreciate the question, and, and the response is, is pretty pragmatic, meaning, you know, we have, a, we have a case for why we think cap and trade is best, but what we recognize is that's not our decision. So we, we advocate for that, but we also don't think there's only one answer to this question. So the idea of a, of a carbon tax, particularly the way you describe it, market-based, you know, outcome performance-based, it would be sort of the next in line, if you would, to a, to a cap and trade system. And my expectation is that's precisely what we'll see in some parts of the world. Let's have our next question from Marvin Odom. Welcome to Climate One. Thank you. We've heard a lot about sequestration, which is um, a good word in your world and a nasty word in, word in the rest of our worlds, especially if you want to fly. Have you been thinking about or are you considering doing some research in possibly besides or instead of sequestering carbon emissions, recycling them in some way? So we do. I mean, we, some of the, uh, I guess, the most obvious ways, this is very internal to the industry, but what we have done, it, you know, this is kind of interesting to think about. Back in the, uh, the 70s and 80s, we used to actually find um, reservoirs, particularly in the area of Colorado and, and, uh, and New Mexico, that actually were almost pure CO2 in the ground. We used to produce this CO2, pipe it to West Texas, to put it into oil fields because when you mix that CO2 with oil, um, it becomes much more miscible. It flows much easier through the reservoir and your recoveries go way up. So now, you know, one of the concepts is, and that CO2 that, you know, when you stop that project, that CO2 stays in the, in the reservoir. A lot of it's recycled over time as you're producing the oil. So one of the most simple concepts within the, uh, the industry is um, use more CO2, capture it now, not from, not, don't produce it from the ground, but actually capture from emissions that would otherwise go into the air and use it for this type of process and increase recovery efficiency with a lower footprint and all the other benefits that come along with that. So we do think about other ways to use it. We worked uh, with the technology for a while around how to take, see it, how to take carbon and actually formulate it a ba basically into a cement mix so that it becomes, you know, and I can see, tell by the nods a lot of people have heard about this, it becomes permanently in that state, and then it could actually be used as building materials and so forth. So we do, we look for those breakthroughs as well. 
Calera is a company not far from here that's, that's doing that. Let's have our next audience question. Welcome. Hi, my, my name is Peter Gisela. I understand you're on one of the boards at Harvard University. And my question has to do with uh, scenarios at more effectively educating the general public about the complexities of these energy issues and energy efficiency. Um, are you open to looking at new scenarios that could more effectively challenge the general public to consider various strategies towards more energy efficiency in their communities? Shell scenarios in every school? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the answer is yes. I, you know, it's one of the, the forever puzzles for me is when I get, uh, you know, we, we get, I get a lot of feedback in this job. And usually the, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you've been very kind tonight, so thank you. The, uh, but that, that uh, feedback is very often, you know, you need to do more as a company, you need to do more as an industry to educate people on some of the, you know, the, the breadth and complexity of these issues so that we can get on with real solutions. So I, you know, I'm, I'm here tonight. I talk about this as much as I can, you know, find time to do it. And I haven't found that magic, magic bullet yet for how to, how to be more effective in that communication. But I do see the interest rising. I do see us able to use, you know, to work with MIT and with Harvard and a number of other organizations, NGOs and others, to help put that complex picture in a, in a more consumable fashion. But I'm open to ideas, so maybe we'll get a chance to talk afterwards. I'm open to ideas. Let's have our next question for Marvin Odom. Welcome. Thank you for being here and talking to us. Um, you seem much more sincere than I expected, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost <laughs> convinced, but there's still this niggling yeah. doubt that you're giving us a really skillful PR line. Yeah. Those that know so, me well know better. <laughs> I'm not that skillful. <laughs> So I'd, I'd like to hear the answer to your question uh, kind of in relation to that. Um, you spoke of the, the advantages of the open market in, in relation to cap and trade, getting the result with the least cost to the economy. Um, how do you feel about subsidies to oil companies which many people feel skew the market. Okay, thanks. Yeah. The, uh, now, I don't think anything I'm going to say now is going to surprise you. The, uh, but I, you know, I would, I would challenge you to get to know me better to, to make up your mind about the sincerity point because I'm confident we'd end up in the right place on that, uh, on that topic. But the, uh, but in terms of subsidies, I think the most dramatic difference between the way you ask the question and the way I'll answer it is I don't call them subsidies, right? I call it a, a tax structure. And I'll give you an example. The, uh, there's a, one of the things that's typically called a, a tax subsidy to the oil and gas industry um, from a number of, of folks in Congress is the manufacturer's tax, a, a tax relief. So if you're a manufacturer in the U.S., you get a tax break of a certain percentage because you're manufacturing in the U.S. And I think the rate, the, the discounts you get is something on the order of 9%. If you're in an industry, you know, whether it's Starbucks or, or a carpet manufacturer or a chemicals manufacturer, this is the rate that you get. And the oil and gas industry gets 6%. So that was, that part of the tax code was already adjusted down specific for this industry. So my, my point is this, not that you'll ever agree that that the tax structure that exists for this industry is where it should be, and I understand that, that you probably don't. But I think the characterization of calling these as special subsidies that go just to the oil and gas industry is, a, is, a, uh, is, a, is the wrong terminology. It's just the tax code. It's just where we are. And that, now there's still an open question as to whether or not we should change that tax code, and that's a policy decision as well. But, but it's, uh, it's not a free ride for the oil and gas companies. But doesn't the depletion allowance have some special things for oil and gas that are not available for other industries, the oil depletion allowance? Well, I mean, it, to the degree that you're, you're discovering a finite resource and producing that resource over time, yeah, because it's unique in that perspective, and there's, there's probably some unique tax code elements to that approach. But conceptually, I would say no. So, but yeah, so it wouldn't apply to solar because solar is infinite and not, not depletable, yeah. And we don't know what, I mean, I don't even know what the... Uh, what, so here's one, thing, one of the things I worry about. Tremendous benefits of driving natural gas into transportation from an, from an environmental perspective. 
the uh, particularly the heavy heavy transportation that I was talking about earlier. If you think about marine and what ships burn and how they get around, there's a the, you know the emissions profile is not something you'd be very very happy with. Those ships can run on liquefied natural gas. We now have the technology to produce liquefied natural gas in various regional points because we've, we've really lowered the cost of doing that at a smaller scale. And we can supply those ships going up and down the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes and so forth. Um, what I don't know is a company, so this is part of the uncertainty I face, is that's not a traditional use for natural gas. I have no idea what the tax structure around that's going to be. Is there going to be, you know, heavy fuel taxes layered on top of that that I'm not anticipating now? Should that slow down my investments or should I go ahead anyway? You know, these are some of the uncertainties that we deal with in the tax code where when you hear people say clarity would help things happen faster, that, again, that's just one example. We have about seven minutes left. Let's try to get as many questions as we can here for Marvin Odom. Welcome. Marvin, appreciate your comments today. I'm Simon Moy with the Natural Resources Defense Council, one of the groups that has been engaging with you on, on some of these issues. Uh, I was interested in hearing Shell's position on AB 32, particularly in support of California's clean energy law, a cap, including cap and trade. Um, so that was refreshing. But at the same time, we're very acutely aware that the oil industry group Shell is part of, the Western States Petroleum Association, has, in our view, been fighting the program in the legislature tooth and nail, as well as in the governor's office. So. I wanted to ask you, what, is, what do you see as Shell's responsibility to ensuring that the oil industry group is actually supporting implementation of California's clean energy law and not just fighting it? Yeah, no, thank you. It's, a, it's another question that I get quite a bit. It usually comes in the context of API, you know, and the American Petroleum, American Institute. Petroleum Institute, which is a trade organization that, that sits primarily in Washington but, but has, you know, global reach. The, uh, I, you know, we take a very simple perspective here, um, which is there's a lot of things that happen in the industry where we agree with our, you know, our sort of fellow companies, if you will, in, in the industry. And there's a lot of places where we don't agree. But principally, you know, once we get to a disagreement, for example, Shell was a, was a significant part of U.S. CAP when we were working on a cap and trade system. That clearly was not an API or, or probably a, uh, you know, a, a trade agency in California WISPA position. But we took that position very publicly and very strongly. So we, we always try to make it very clear where we are as a company and where we stand. But we'd much rather work these issues also from the inside in our industry rather than every time we disagree, we say, well, that's it for this group, we're walking away, which I think is absolutely the wrong way to do it. So, you know, we sit at the table at API just like we do at WISPA and, and a number of other places around the world. And we, we fight for those things we support, and we, you know, we heartily debate those things we disagree with. And ultimately, those trade agencies take a position which may or may not reflect our company's position on that particular issue. But I do think you'll find us to be transparent about where we are as a company. Okay. Let's have our next uh, question. Welcome. I'm David Leggett. I'm a civil engineer. Uh, getting back to the question about public relations, I hear a lot of uh, TV advertisements mainly saying we support uh, renewable energy. And it sounds great, yeah. but what I would like to hear is specifics. What is your uh, revenue, percent of revenue today from oil and natural gas and renewables? And what will it be in 20 years? And how can you relate that to how that affects emissions? Yeah. Specifically, with, with real numbers, and, yeah. and to say okay. this is thank, where thank we're, you for, we're headed. Thank you for that. No, it's a great, it's a great question. And I, I do think I completely understand where the challenge is coming from. So, so again, a very frank answer, which is the percentage of both our investment and our revenue that comes from, I think, the way you characterize renewable resources is very, very small. And I'm crystal clear about Less that. Less than 1%? Uh, I don't know. Actually, I don't know exactly what, but it's small. So I have a wind business. I have a gigawatt wind business. Um, I keep it. It's not growing. It's fairly stagnant. Uh, but I keep it because it's a it's a well-run, okay business. Not a good business, but it's an okay. But from a you know financial standpoint. Uh, but we went into the wind business to understand what it was really all about and to understand the potential of it, how quickly it might grow, and so forth. It, so again, I get back to where Shell is as a company today, where our technical skills are, 
And the challenge in front of us is how do we reduce CO2 emissions? I just picked that as, a, as the environmental challenge. Then the most important thing I can do as a company is produce more natural gas, is to look for ways to, to provide an alternative fuel for transportation, which is the hardest nut to crack in this whole deal, um, and to look for ways to otherwise reduce carbon emissions. So I just told you we're over 50% natural gas now, and that's been a long-term trend that we've been pushing towards. Um, we're investing in biofuels in Brazil because after scanning the world, that was the place where it made the most sense. Now we're one of the largest single biofuels producers in the world, but I also told you, you know, that's not even enough to produce enough to where it gets out of the country. I think it's, it's something <clears> like <throat> 2 billion liters a year that we produce, but it almost all gets consumed in Brazil. But that's, that was the right biofuels to, uh, to work. And then we're putting huge investments into, you know, for example, the carbon capture and storage project that I talked about, because that is core to our skills. It directly impacts business that likely is going to continue to happen over the future decades, and that's how we can have a big impact. Now, I could take that money and, and build more wind farms and other things, and I do lots of research and development around advanced biofuels and, and other forms of energy. But, but for real CO2 reductions, the three things I mentioned are the biggest impact I can have over the next one to two or maybe even more decades. We're at the end here. I just want to ask uh, last question. Uh, 2012 was a remarkable year. It was the hottest year on record. Hurricane Sandy uh, closed the New York Stock Exchange for two days, 13-foot storm surge in New York, uh, epic droughts in Texas and across the country. How urgent is climate change, and how do you think it'll affect you and your family going forward? Well, I, I think my, you know, my sense has, has transitioned, I'd say, primarily over the last decade. So I, I answer this question personally to the sincerity of one. I think it's urgent. I think action needs to happen. I think yeah, I find myself at times in a very difficult position because, you know, it, it does get actually a little, you know, the, the idea of, you know, we don't trust you, we think you're doing all the wrong things and so forth. Is, does get a little tiresome. At the same time, I, you, know, I, it, you know, I take great strength in knowing as a company where we're, we're actually working very hard to do the right things and to open up some paths for reduce, reduce CO2 emissions across the globe. So I'm, I'm proud of what we do as a company. Um, but I think action is, is urgent. I think the, you know, we have to fix this link, if you will, between business and government and society which feels completely broken, but I have a strong recognition that we can't move forward. It's not about a single company or even a single industry moving forward and fixing this problem. If those three aren't working together, we can't get there. And I, you know, I point to the gentleman from NRDC as an example. We've done some great work with, uh, with NRDC, and we disagree on a lot of things as, uh, as well. But those relationships are critically important. Um, and the final point I'll make is you just can't give up because you know it is that important it does have to happen and i do think we'll get to a point where this is all more clear and it starts to happen at a much faster pace and we're just trying to prepare things in the meantime do you think that it will require something worse than sandy that will be a, a, a worse crisis that will provoke that action so well, you know i can only answer again i feel like i can only answer that question from a personal perspective which is i look at the world and how it reacts to those kind of things and clearly that speaks to some people but I don't think that the world sees isolated climate events or, you know, weather events as, as the ultimate signal for climate change. I, so that's part of it, I think. But Especially I don't, think that's, not I don't think that's the <laughs> biggest issue. I think the biggest issue in terms of, I like the way Cho described it, in terms of getting the bottom up, meeting the top down, is there's a tremendous number of urgent issues in the world. And there's a lot of those urgent issues that, you know, that come up tomorrow and the next day. And thinking in terms of, the climate system and what needs to happen there is just very, very hard for the, you know, the general public to do. We have to end it there. Our thanks to Marvin Odom, president of Shell Oil Company, and Cho Kong, chief strategist at Shell, for joining us today. Thank you for joining us on the radio and Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Thanks for coming.